How you doing, man? I'm good, man. How you doing? Good, good, good. Well, you know, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. And like I mentioned uh, in our while we were messaging each other, I was very excited for this. And um, you know, before we get started, can you give like a little intro of who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah. What's up? Um, my name is Illogic, uh, aka Jawar Glass. Uh, I rap, produce, um, do photography, videography, um, a lot of things. I'm a father, <laughs> husband. <laughs> right. yeah. I, I, I do a lot of things. What are some of the things that you know that keeps you busy or motivates you to stay busy? Um really just trying to be the best at everything that I do. Um, really just trying to always be better than I was yesterday. You know, um, trying to make sure that I'm an example for not only my children, but for other artists, um, other men, um, and just other people in general, and just trying to continue to utilize the platform that I've been given um, for, for good, you know? So I try always to you know, keep elevating every time that I release a project or do a video or, you know, just whatever I do, I, I do my best to try to be better, better at it every time. Nice. Now, have you always had that mentality? No, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, I think the thing is, like, when I was younger, I was more focused on just, you know, um, just doing good and being able to survive. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and like, I've always, as far as being a rapper, I've always wanted to be the best at that. So I've always had that mentality with that. But in my later years, you know, I'm 41 now. Um, so in my later years, I've definitely, you know, taken that mindset and tried to point it in the direction of other things in my life. Um, just trying to constantly improve and constantly be a better human being on a regular basis. But no, I, I didn't always think that way. You know, I used to be a lot more worried about, you know, just, just getting through, you know, just, just surviving and getting through the day, getting through the week, you know, making sure that bills were paid and things like that, you know, and instead of really planning for the future and, you know, looking forward and making long-term goals and things like that are, uh, that's, that's fairly new for me. Right. No, I mean, you look, you look great for being 41, man. I gotta say. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> damn. <clears throat> I drink out of some go down the wrong pipe. <laughs> Damn. Mm. Give me a second. I'm gonna try not to die on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> Dang, my bad. Sorry about that. That's not good. That's the worst, man. I hate yeah. that. <laughs> so like when I mean when I was younger, I didn't have any there wasn't much motivation or goals that were set up myself to and now what kind of molded me to do more things and just keep myself busy is you know my kid because now um now I know my daughter's like watching me and watching what I do and how I act and you right. know who I talk to and how how I keep myself self busy and the distractions that I do uh, is that mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, now, now, you, now that you have kids, is those one of the things that you also see in yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've always wanted to be a good example um, for my kids, um, just as far as, you know, just being, you know, especially as a person of color, you know, just wanting them to see their father, you know, be better than you know, the things that are presented to them on the media. Um, and so my children and my wife are definitely huge motivators um, for me to continue to, you know, build and, and strive to be the best person that I can be. 
Yeah. Now, one of the, I mean, I came across you when it was years ago when I was into graffiti and when I was, I was tagging back in the day and uh, okay. <clears throat> my cousin introduced me to Immortal Technique and, you know, one, it was great because right after Immortal Technique, I started coming across Atmosphere, you, mm-hmm. Binary Star, ASAP Rock, and, mm-hmm. you know, and when I, I really liked, you know, the stuff, especially your album, Celestial Clockwork, uh-huh. that one had, because that one was really like, uh, it was just, it was an album that made me think a lot about, you know, about time and even just the beats that you have just Mm -hmm. put me like put my brain in a different level um where how like um what motivated you to like for for celestial clockwork what made it motivate you to make that album and make it the way that it became to be um well really i mean i made that album when i was about about 18 when i wrote a lot of it yeah so i was super young um when i wrote most of it um and it was just honestly like the life, you know, the life in times that I was going through at the time. Um, I was, you know, in college, you know, in late high school going into college. And, you know, it was just a lot of things that were going through my mind at the time. Um, and, you know, with with my music, I try to really incorporate a lot of myself. You know, I always tell people that when I write, I usually write for me first and then the audience or, Mm -hmm. you know, my fans. Um, Mm -hmm. But my writing is more of a therapy for me to get my feelings out. You know, there's a lot of times that I'll write something and I won't truly understand it until after it's done. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of, you know, therapy in, you know, the therapeutic aspects of my writing, especially with that album. Um, because I was going through a lot of depression at the time. Um, I was, you know, really down on myself, down on life, just not really looking at the positive things, which is why the album is kind of dark. Um, and, you know, really talks about a lot of the dark sides of thoughts and, you know, that we think about ourselves and we think about the world in general. Um, so, you know, at that time, that was the things, you know, those were the things that I needed to get out. Um, and, you know, I, I always believe that um, the gift that I've been given to write and make songs is, you know, definitely to help me, but also to help other people and help them realize that they're not alone in certain situations. You know, a lot of times, especially with depression, you feel like you're the only one going through what you're going through at the time. And um, I think I've, you know, given a lot of people that, that, um, comfort to know that you know there's someone else out there that understands you know what I'm going through and the things that I'm dealing with you know if not directly definitely indirectly Mm -hmm. you know because of course we all go through different things but you know the principle of most things are still the same right and that's one of the I would say that's one of the like crazy things about music and it's kind of weird is that some of the best music is kind of you know it goes mm, one of the best music is pretty much when someone is going through some tough times Mm -hmm. you know why 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 is that what do you think i mean because that's when you're i I think that's when especially us as human beings are more in touch with our emotions Mm. you know like we really we really think a lot more when we're going through tough times we really look for outlets a lot more when we're going through tough things when things are good you know we just want to be happy and want to just keep going and keep going in the direction we're going but when things are bad you're looking for change you know you're looking to change direction you're looking at you know where you are in your life at the moment and what things you need to change in order to get to a better place so we're a lot more contemplative in those times of you know darkness and you know, those times that we really need to make some changes in our lives. We're a little more introspective. You know, we think a lot more, we're more calculating, you know, we're more strategic in our movements 
because we don't want things to continue to be dark. We don't want things to continue to be bad. So we're looking for ways to improve our situations. So we're a lot more thought, you know, it's a lot more thought provoking when you're going through something bad than when you're going through something good. Mm -hmm. So is the logic in real life, like out in the streets on your daily, are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? I'm an introvert. I mean, I, 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 like COVID for me has been like the best thing ever because, because <laughs> even before COVID, I didn't go out much, you know what I'm saying? So now I have an excuse to not go out, you know what I mean? Right. I have an, yeah, I have an excuse to sit in my basement and make beats and write songs and stuff. So You're like, um, shit, I was doing to- this before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. This is, this is me anyway. You know, like a lot of times I think before COVID I felt almost, you know, forced, you know, sometimes ah. to go out and be social just because it was somebody's birthday or, you know, like, you know, the fellas going to the bar to watch a football game or something. And not that I don't like hanging out my, with my mm-hmm. friends, but I would much more, I'm much more comfortable and much more prefer to be sitting at home, you know, doing my own thing, working on my own, you know, art or watching a right. movie hanging out with my wife, whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely an introvert. Definitely. Right. And I mean, I think that's, that's very important. I mean, because especially now that you, you, now the, you know, this whole COVID thing happened because like I was, a, uh, I was, I'm kind of the same way to where, you know, I'm introvert when I, cause I try to avoid large crowds but I do like to go out and explore, but I don't like mm-hmm. to go out and explore with my family and that's it, you know? <laughs> <All> so, <right. laughs> yeah. So, and you know, with COVID you, I mean, we already, me and my family were already, we already hang out enough time to know each other, but there's mm-hmm. people out there that don't really spend a lot of time with their family and then COVID hits and they're like, damn, like, who are these people, you know? <laughs> Now they really start thinking about the decisions and be like, damn, you know, they've been living here, but I didn't really know who they are. Right. You right, know? right. And yeah. I mean, there's a lot of couples out there that, I mean, imagine if, you know, if you were still, if you were in the dating zone and you were stuck with a girlfriend that you just met and now you're in the apartment together and, you know, during this whole COVID and that's when you really, think about like okay what what's you know who's this person and what the heck did I get myself into (laughs) right right yeah my mother um actually works for um a um an attorney and she said that like the amount of divorces that she's had to you know process throughout this COVID thing for the last year has Mm -hmm. been ridiculously high because you know like you yeah like you said like a lot of people you know, they lived their lives. So they were going to work and, you know, they would, they wouldn't spend any real time together. And now, you know, like me and my wife, um, we, I mean, we were good. We were good anyway, but, you know, just having to work from home, you know what I'm saying? Like, and not leaving the house for that eight hours and not being around that person or even your kids for that time. And now, you know, I work from home now. So for the last year, I've been home pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. And my wife was too for a while until she got a new job. Now she's out of the house. But for that time, luckily, we have a pretty big place. So I would work in the basement, she would work upstairs. So it was still like we would leave each other and get that separation and get that time away. Um, But yeah, there's a lot of people that now that they have to work from home and they're around each other basically 24 seven, it's like, I don't really like you, you know, (laughs) (laughs) like I'm realizing that I don't like you that much. And I don't know if I want to spend the rest of my life like this. So um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. There, it was definitely, I think COVID was definitely an eye opener for a lot of people. I mean, mm-hmm. there is those people that really, you know, took advantage of it and did something productive. Like, thankfully for me, within that time, I I lost some jobs and I started this podcast. So I okay. would say that, you know, it was kind of, oh, I, I, we like humans, we got to adapt with whatever comes. And if you don't, I believe you don't adapt, you get left behind, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's those people that, unfortunately they they don't adapt and they just they get stuck behind uh, yeah. it's, it's definitely 
it's something it's something unfortunate well um like one of the things i was reading is that you know isaac newton um when he came out with the theory of gravity of gra gra gravity that was when the bubonic plague happened okay and the uh, during the bubonic plague everybody had to be in quarantine for two years and because wow. the plague was going on he had to go back home to his ranch and in his ranch there that's where he sat in the tree and that's where you know the apple fell down the same story that yeah. everybody knows the apple fell down and that's when the idea of gravity happened so i mean there's a, uh, there are some people that you know um, go through unfortunate things but it also kind of you know it, it it's an eye opener for a lot of other people too yeah i mean it woke me up i mean like you know i i started my own kind of podcast um mm. where i do a live um a live session usually on fridays or saturdays or you know throughout the week um mm -hmm. i'll pick a day and you know i'll make beats live or you know i'll just talk for a little bit play beats um you know i've done you know like tributes to you know different artists or different mm. albums of my own um just different things like that and without the pandemic i would have never started that you know mm. what i mean I, I i had to figure out a way to connect with my fans a little better um and you know that was something that um i saw as an opportunity and i did some investment in you know getting some cameras and things like that and um you know, it's called Beats and B-Sides. Okay. And, um, you know, and that was a really good thing that I started and something that I'm definitely continuing even after the pandemic, you know, is over. Um, I'm going to continue to do that. Um, and, you know, it just got me focused. You know, I, I don't think without the pandemic, I probably wouldn't have released my album last year right. either. You know what I'm saying? Like, it really got me focused and got me to, you know, buckle down and really look at things and see, you know, because like you said, like if people don't, if you don't take advantage of this time, you know, a lot of people are going to be behind when everything reopens up and everything's kind of back to normal, which I think we're still about three to five years away from. Really? Um, but yeah, I think I think it's going to be a long time before things are back, quote unquote, to normal. Um, but, you know, it's getting better mm -hmm. um, slowly, but surely. But um, I think the thing is, when it does get back to normal, there's going to be a lot of artists that are no longer you know doing music there's going to be mm. a lot of people that were doing certain things before the pandemic that you know because they dropped the ball and they didn't take advantage of this time mm. to you know make themselves better you know and take you know the time because this is crazy because during this pandemic the one thing that we were given even though it took a lot of things away from us the one thing that everyone was given was more time Mm. everyone was given more time for the right. most part everyone was given more time to concentrate on certain things that they wanted to do the fact that you didn't have to spend that hour in the car to commuting back to work you know that added an hour to your day you know what i'm right. saying there's a lot of there's a lot of things that that you know pandemic was it's a bad thing i mean it's horrible you know but mm -hmm. You got to see the silver lining and and one thing that we got a lot of out of this was time so if you invested that time in your life then you're going to come out ahead if you just saw the time as extra time to be on facebook longer mm. you know or watch more movies or watch more reality tv then you're going to you're going to be left behind once everything gets started again yeah very true very true very true uh yeah I w i'm from um I'm I'm in, I'm in Texas right now, and you know here oh. it seems like things were going back to normal slowly. And I don't know if you heard on the news and stuff like that, but just last week, yeah, it was last week we get hit with like this week long of winter. Yeah, where it dropped down to zero degrees, and I'm I was raised in Cali, and <laughs> okay. this is all. <laughs> This it's is all only, new to you, right? Yes. This is only my <laughs> second year in Texas. So we were, at, I mean, it, it slowly creeped up. So I was like, okay, it's not that bad. And then boom, the next day, zero degrees, snow outside, ice everywhere, crash accidents. And we we're like, dang. And then, yeah. you know, that happened. And then just yesterday, 
there was it started raining and then all you see is like big balls of hell just dropping on cars so we're like damn even though COVID's like <laughs> leaving, we still get now we're we're just you know trying to figure out what next week is gonna be you know <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's funny. Cause I, I have, I have some friends that are in Texas and, mm. um, you know, like this is like foreign territory, you know, like I have friends that live there, you know, all their lives are long periods of time. And they're like, you know, they don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea of what to do. You know, like coming from the Midwest, our winter is we get snow every year, you know what I'm saying? Like we get, zero degree weather we get you know there might be a blizzard you know what i'm saying like right. we're we're kind of used to that kind of thing um right. but you know like the southern states and especially the western states like once it snows it's like life is over for <laughs> for at least a week you know right, right. <laughs> yes yes for sure so now from yeah me for celestial clockwork wasn't your first album was it no, it wasn't. Oh, it was okay. actually, it was it was the third album that I released. Um, mm -hmm. It was the second album that I actually recorded. Um, my first album was called Unforeseen Shadows, oh, and right. that was released in 1999. Wow. Um, and then Celestial Clockwork, I actually wrote Celestial Clockwork. Supposed It was supposed to be the follow-up album. Mm -hmm. um, and then there ended up being some issues with some record labels so we redid we did um the got lyrics album which was my second album that i released and um we did that and you know that was got released uh you know a lot of uh, fanfare and high acclaim and then celestial clockwork was the third album which came out in 2004. nice so from your first album to now what are some of the key things that you've learned in the in this in the in the music industry um how important it is to understand the business aspect of you know the industry and how important ownership is um to an independent artist okay. like myself um you know i i've had record you know being on labels i've done all of those things and there is nothing more powerful and more lucrative for an independent artist than ownership of their masters, ownership of their brand, ownership of their mm -hmm. likeness, um, because then you have the flexibility to move and shake however you want and, you know, be able to adapt to what, you know, what is going on in the world. Um, you know, a lot of, especially, large labels, you know, they sign a lot of artists to deals where the labels, you know, get a piece of everything. You know, if you press up your own t-shirts, even though they have nothing to do with it, they still get 10% of it. Right. If you press up posters, they still get 10%. They still get, you know, um, so that's one of the things that I've learned in the beginning of my career, I was more concerned with just rapping. I didn't necessarily care about the business as much. Luckily, I um, started out with a group of people that handled the business that actually did take care of me and that were trustworthy. And, um, you know, still to this day, me and Blueprint are, you know, we still work together. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he did take care of me in those times when I had, I didn't know what the books looked like. I didn't know how many albums I was actually selling. I didn't, but I trusted the people that I was associated with and the people that wrote the checks for me. Um, and a lot of times, you know, artists get in certain situations, especially when they're young, where they just want to rap and they just want to have a little money in their pocket and they don't really pay attention to the fine print. Mm. Um, and so I've learned that that is super important. So now I'm in a position where I can write my own ticket to do whatever I want. If I license a song to a movie, I get 100% of that profit, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, you know, writing a check to a manager or writing a check to a label right. or anything like that. And that is extremely important. And I'm not looking at, you know, at this point in my career, um, I've been doing it so long, I'm not looking to be, you know, 
a millionaire off of music. If it happens, it happens, but I'm not shooting for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm shooting to just continue to do what I love and be able to have it as something that brings in, you know, some, a little money every year, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking at it to be my main thing. Now, if it becomes that, you know, I'm, I'm open to it, Mm -hmm. but I'm not putting all my eggs in that basket because, you know, I got a lot more responsibility, but the fact that I have the mindset now of more of a businessman as my music is concerned than I did when I was younger um, actually creates more of an opportunity for that to possibly happen, Mm -hmm. you know? So um, it's definitely important for all artists, no matter what your genre is, if you do music, if you paint pictures, if you take, if you're a photographer, you know, videographer, any of that stuff, it's important to understand how important owning your own shit is right you know so that's right. that's the biggest thing that i've learned that i mean that's 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 great um yeah that's i mean that's kind of what every what everybody wants but it's not really uh portrayed out there you know because you got these huge million dollar companies that you know that people see as soon as you get, you know, sign a contract with them, they'll give you millions or whatever, but you know, they don't get to see uh, exactly how much they're taking for themselves. And you're not really see the percentage that they get and the percentage that you get. And sometimes mm-hmm. the percentage for them could be higher, right? Well, yeah. I mean, if, if they're willing to pay you millions, best believe they're making tens of millions, if not hundreds mm-hmm. of millions. You know, like if an artist can sign a million dollar contract to, I mean, I read, I read something um, not too long ago that the music industry makes almost a million dollars an hour or a minute. It was something crazy, you know? So if, if a record label has enough money to pay 20 artists every day, a million dollar advance, imagine how much money they have to be making in order to be able to do that. Right. You know, like the fact that, you know, a normal person makes maybe, you know, a thousand dollars a week, $2,000 a week, whatever they make. Like the fact that a record label can just give you, when you sign a contract that day, give you a check for a million dollars. Imagine how much money they're actually making right. because you're not right. the only person that's getting that check. You know, they're signing multiple artists daily. You know what I mean? Like, and we don't see all of them, but all of them, a lot of times get advances. You know, it could be a hundred thousand dollars. It could be $500,000, depending on, you know, their faith in what you can do. But, you know, there's some artists that get two, two to $5 million contracts and get advances on that. Imagine what the company is making off of them. It's mm-hmm. usually tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, all that glitters ain't gold all the time. Like, yeah, to right. some of us, especially a lot of us, you know, because a lot of the people that do rap are young, you know, African-American, Latino, you know, or poor, you know, white kids that come from places where they don't necessarily have money. So you put a million dollars in front of a kid who hmm. has never seen a thousand dollars, you know, like, why wouldn't they sign that contract? Right. You know, right. so it's it's a, it's definitely a, a, a thing that, you know, is is dangerous for a lot of, you know, artists um, if you don't understand the industry, mm-hmm. you know, but it's very important to understand the things that you're getting into. Always have a lawyer read over contracts, always understand, you know, what's in your best interest as an artist, because there's a reason they're giving you that contract because they see something in you. So you have some room to negotiate a lot of times and, you know, try to do your best to make sure you get what you're worth. Mm -hmm. I can, I, I don't know if it's still the same, but I consider you as, and like many others, like atmosphere, immortal technique, a sub rock as underground artists. Is that the the correct term for me? Oh, okay. Now is that, is that the correct, is that being underground, being an underground artist is that what's giving you the freedom to kind of be your the bo- your own boss of your own music of your own label and all that? Um, yeah, well, yeah, to an extent. Um, but there's still like 
an artist like ASAP Rock or even Atmosphere. Um, they're part, they're on the Rhyme Sayers label. So it's still a record label. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and Rhyme mm -hmm. Sayers take their percentage and all of that stuff. But as an independent record label, you still, you know, they still give their artists a lot more freedom to mm -hmm. do things that they want to do, even though they still get their cut, you know. But the artists themselves, the reason that they sign these artists you know, and of course, atmosphere is part of the whole beginning of Rhyme Sayers anyway. But the reason a lot of the artists that are on Rhyme Sayers or even the, you know, other record labels like um, Mellow Music or, you know, a lot of these other independent labels, the reason they sign these artists is because they want them to be themselves. Mm. You know, it's encouraged for them to be themselves, even though they take their cut and they get, you know, they have to make money as a label. But it's a good home for a lot of artists that are a little, too big to take care of their own, you know, merchandise and send out their own, you know, mailers and things like that. Um, you know, it's good for those kind of artists because, you know, they still have the freedom to move about how they want to and do what they want to. Um, and, but they have a machine behind them that does a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, you know, for artists like me who, you know, I'm not as big as ASAP Rock or Atmosphere. So I still, do everything myself you know I, mm. I take care of my own website i take care of my own you know merchandise i i buy all of that stuff out of pocket mm. you know i take i take a lot of that you know i have to do a lot of all, all of that really myself um so i don't have that you know cushion and it doesn't necessarily i think you know really if if um atmosphere or asap was in the same position as me then I, th I don't think they would probably be on a label either. You know what I'm saying? So it it definitely makes more sense. And you just, you just definitely have to look at what makes the most sense for you and your career. Um, but we are all underground because we do have that freedom to kind of move and shake how we want. Um, but there are also levels to the underground as well. Right, you know? right. No, that, that, makes, that makes more definitely sense because, I mean... Um, I would imagine that even the people that are in the, you know, higher class media with, you know, million dollar companies, they're not only, they're kind of not, they're not given that freedom to express themselves. Now they're given, right. you know, directions from manager where they go to meetings and they talk about, okay, you know, you're going to, this is what I need you to talk about. It's like they're, they're given an agenda of what mm -hmm. to say, what to sing about. And the great benefit about kind of being underground is that you still have that freedom to talk about and sing about whatever you want, you know? Right. Yeah. We don't have the pressure. I mean, we all want to sell records, right? You know, right. like we all want to make sure that, you know, if we're making this investment into, you know, our art, if we're buying, you know, CDs, if we're buying vinyl, if we're buying this stuff and paying for these things that we make that money back. But the mindset in how to do that is different. When you're dealing with multi-million dollar companies, like, you know, the record labels that sign a lot of the bigger artists, then, you know, they have a little more control to mm. say, why don't you make an album that sounds like this? Mm. You know, like, and it's not necessarily that they are controlling you, but they're telling you, if you make an album like this, then we'll definitely put it out and you'll be rich. Uh, you know, if you do what you want to do, then there's no guarantee that we'll put the album out. There's right. no guarantee that you'll get this, you know, multi-million dollar budget, you know, for the record if we don't support it. You know what I'm saying? So there's a different kind of pressure depending right. on the level that you're at. And even in the underground, there's definitely still pressure. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's pressure on atmosphere when, you know, if Rhyme Sayers, um, you know, uh, invest, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars into their campaign or into a tour, it's pressure to make that money back to make sure that the label is still functioning and that we can continue to put out more records, you know, but it's not to the level of these multi-million dollar deals and contracts. And, you know, and that's where the label comes in, like, you know, we need you to sound like Drake, you know, we need yeah. you to sound like, you know, this guy, right. because he's selling records and that sound sells records. So this is what we need you to do. You know, it's, right. it's, it's definitely right. different. Right. And I, I would imagine that would be kind of a tough question that 
you're going to have to ask yourself, you know, if you were to get at that point, okay, do you want to sign a contract with this corporate that now you got to meet with whatever they want, or do you want to stick to this independent uh, corporation or company where you have the freedom to sing about whatever you want, right? Yeah, and, and make a little less money. You know, because that's what it boils down to a lot of times for people is, you know, do I want to be a multimillionaire or do I want to, you know, be a thousandaire? You know, (laughs) like, do I want to make a couple hundred thousand dollars off of this or do I want to make a couple million dollars off of this? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where the decision lies. And, you know, sometimes it's it, it makes sense, you know, for certain artists, because, you know, like an artist, an artist like Kendrick Lamar, for example, He's the guy that, you know, one of the anomalies of Mm -hmm. the industry, even Drake to an an extent, are one of the anomalies to the, you know, some of the anomalies to the industry to where they know how to make what people want. And it just so happens to be what they're good at and the things that they want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, like Kendrick Lamar, I, I doubt that he's walked into a record label and they said, well, why don't you make this kind of record? Because him being himself is what has made him what he is. Right. You know, so he continues to be able to make an acid jazz record like To Pimp a Butterfly, Mm -hmm. you know, and still sell millions of records. Right. You know, and it's unfortunate that there's not more of those out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, the thing is, the industry is just, they're looking at Kendrick as a unicorn as opposed to what the standards should be. You know, they're looking at an artist like J. Cole as a unicorn as opposed to what the standard should be. There's a lot of J. Coles out there. There's a lot of Kendricks out there. There's a lot of artists that are doing something that possibly could sell millions of records if they had the push behind them to get in front of the public like, you know, a lot of these other artists do. But, you know, the labels are scared to to, you know, invest in experiments anymore. Back in the day, you know, when I was coming up in the 80s and 90s it was bad to sound like anyone else Mm -hmm. you didn't want to sound like anyone else record labels wouldn't pick you up if you sounded like anyone else you know so now everything has switched now you have to sound like someone else Mm -hmm. in order for you to get a record deal so it's a very interesting thing that I've you know seen throughout my years of life and you know being part of you know this whole crazy industry right now, have you been with uh, uh, Blueprint? Have 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 like a big corporation or anybody like that giving you an offer to just leave Blueprint and go into somewhere else where you're offered more money and stuff like that? Well, before Blueprint, um, I had some. You know, I was in a couple of different rap groups when I was younger, um, and had some offers from you know some major labels mm. um, when I was younger. Um, you know, so, so deaf, um, wanted to sign me and my friend, Mm -hmm. um, when I was younger and, um, you know, we, we didn't end up doing it, um, just, you know, cause it wasn't a fit for what we, you know, wanted to do when we were younger, but, you know, I've had, you know, certain opportunities to sign with bigger labels that I've turned down. I've had, you know, opportunities to do, you know, all kinds of things, um, throughout my career, as far as acting, as far as, Mm -hmm. you know, but, um, I have principles, you know, and I have, um, you know, things that lines that I won't cross, you know, right. and no matter how much money is offered to me, you know, there's just certain things that I won't do as an artist, as a man, you know, like there's just certain things that I won't do. So, you know, I've turned down probably millions of dollars in my career um, just to stay true and be able to be in more control of you know the person and the artist that I wanted to be right so is that what's kind of keeping you from um from signing on to this bigger labels is just knowing what your principles are I mean a lot of times um you know in general I mean if I if if I was offered a record deal from a larger label um then there would be stipulations you know like I know what I'm worth you know I Mm. know what I'm capable of, you know, I know what I bring to the table as an artist. So I wouldn't get, you know, 
they wouldn't be able to take me and just do with me what they will. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that's probably why a lot of underground artists stay underground because they've had the opportunities to go, you know, to jump that, that to that next level. And because they have principles, there's certain things that they just won't do. Right. Right. You know, so that's not necessarily what's keeping me from it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was offered something, then, you know, I would do some negotiation and see what I could get out of it and see if it was the best thing for me and my family um, at this point in my life. And, um, you know, see if it's the best thing for me and my moral principles. Um, But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it, but you know, there would be stipulations. So for someone like young starting up as a, as a rap artist and you know he's starting off underground and you know thankfully you you already know the industry you know how it works you know the ins and outs you know you know that you're not gonna do anything that um that you're not gonna enjoy or that's gonna keep you from you know expressing yourself what if it if someone that's young and started from underground if they were to given that offer to move on to a bigger label with money, what would, what is, would be one of the things that you would want them to know? Um, you know, what are your principles? You know, like that's the, that's the big question. You know, are there limits to things that you would do? How much control do you want? Mm-hmm. You know, do you want to own, you know, your likeness? Do you want to own, you know, your masters? Do you want to be in control of your career? You know, and if that's the things that you want, then that's the things that you should ask for. And if those things aren't able to be given to you, then, you know, you make you make that move and keep pushing on your independent hustle. Because the thing is, a record label isn't going to approach somebody that isn't valuable already. Right. So if you're already the fact that you're already valuable and the fact that you're already, you know, doing something special then all the millions of dollars in the world isn't going to change or shouldn't change Mm. the person who you are. So if you're able to continue on the same path that you want to go on creatively, you know, um, socially, um, you know, um, then, you know, do that if you can, if you, if you can, you know, get a deal and do that. But if you can't, then it's all about, you know, how your integrity as a person, you know, so ask yourself that question before you sign that deal. Like, what am I willing to give up, you know, for this money? Cause that's really all it is, you know, this money and the fame, all it, that's all it is in the long run. You know, more people will know what your face looks like. More people will know your name. Um, more people will hear your songs and more people will buy them. So, you know, and that's a big thing to a lot of people, but, how important is that in the long run, you know, to you as a person and to your faith and to your morality um, and to your principles? Right. Yeah. And, you know, now I see that, you know, with more technology and as technology advances, I feel like there's more opportunities for any type of entrepreneurship. Like, for instance, like podcasts, you, you're not now you don't have to go to these medias like Fox, CNN, ABC to get your news or to know what's going on. Now you can simply subscribe to a journalist that you can trust, that you know they're not going to give you an BS, that you know that they do their research. And even, you know, anybody can, there's a ton of podcasts. And if they want to, you know, someone that talks about the music industry, they could go ahead and subscribe to, to your channel. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like that's going to be, that's, I mean, that's, that's a benefit out of technology. That's really helping us grow. And hopefully eventually it becomes more of that to where, you know, now, like you said, everybody can be controlled of their own business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of opportunity out there, you know, for people to become their own entity. You know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people got famous off of YouTube. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people got famous off of Facebook. A lot of people got famous off of Instagram. Um, So the thing is, 
if you were able to get fame without a corporation, then you should be able to continue to, you know, build your company without a corporation as well, Mm. you know, so, but it just takes a little more work, right? You know what I mean? It just takes a little more work. So if you're willing to do that work, then you can definitely continue to build your company and, and still be an entrepreneur. But a lot of people look for the easy way out. Just as human beings, yeah. we just naturally look for the least path of resistance. So, you know, if it's, if it's easier to make a million dollars in 20 minutes than it is to make a million dollars in five years, I'm going to go with the 20 minutes. That's just right. my nature. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, there's some of us that understand, you know, what taking those five years means to our future as opposed to that 20 minutes you know that could still be gone in 20 minutes as well you know but if you put in that work for that five years then you can really develop yourself as an artist and as a person to continue to make a million more in the next five years and a million more in the next you know and maybe it'll cut down to three years instead for your next million you know because you have more knowledge and things like that so you know it's just really all about what people want and um what's important to them in the long run. Right. Uh, you know, before doing the podcast, I was doing, I was doing a lot of trial and errors, trying to do things here and there. And, you know, once I got to the podcast thing, I realized that, you know, I wasn't really sticking to one particular thing. And just like you said, I was trying to go with the easiest thing. And Mm -hmm. if I saw that it wasn't making me money after a couple months, I would jump into the next thing. Mm -hmm. And eventually I learned that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight or even even that happened after two weeks or a month, six, you never, you almost never know, you know, and now I learned that, you know, you need to have self-discipline and you need to have patience. And as long as you continue to do what you love, that should be all that matters. What were some of the things that kind of kept you going that you said, you said, you know what, even though it doesn't work out, I'm still, I'm glad I'm still doing what I love. Um, I mean, just that, just the love, you know, like I love writing songs. I love making beats. I love taking photos. I love shooting videos. I love all of the things that I do, Mm. you know, so just the love for it, you know, whether I'm making a hundred dollars or, you know, a thousand dollars off of something uh, or nothing, you know, like I'm still going to come in my basement and make some beats Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm still going to come in my basement and write some rhymes. And even if people never hear it, or if, if it, you know, never really, catches on and sells I'm still going to continue because I love doing what I do um and you know it's it it just so happens that a lot of people do like what I do so you know I can also make some money off of it and I can also you know pay a couple bills here and there um with it um but you know it's just the love it wasn't always like that you know and I've been you know I've been rapping for almost 30 years now, you know, and, you know, just in the last probably maybe 10 to 20 is when I started making some money. Mm. Um, And probably in the last maybe 10, five, 10 years is where I really started to understand how to make money and the, and what was necessary for me to put, you know, the investment that I needed in order to really start to turn this into something that could be, you know, a definite lucrative thing for possibly the rest of my life. Right. It seems like that's almost the, you know, the perfect formula to eventually um, getting, getting paid to what you do is like going, going into doing what you love without expecting anything. Because when you mm-hmm. expect nothing and you just continue to to do what you love to do, you're yeah, you're not making profit and you don't have you don't you're not making money, but you're gaining experience and you're learning right. the industry. And then once you learn the industry and once you have enough experience, then that's when the you know, that's when um, the profit comes in 
or it may not. Yeah. But I mean, there I've heard a lot of stories where it does, but you know, everything has its moment. Everything has its time. And as long as yeah. you have patience, it'll, you know, it'll eventually get there. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely will. I mean, if you just keep pushing and, you know, if, especially if it's something that you're good at, you know, there are um, times when, you know, sometimes the universe is telling you, you might need to switch it up. You know, right. you might need to do right. something else. You know, there's right. some people that, you know, want to be rappers, but can't rap a lick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's some people that want to be singers, but can't sing. You can't, right. you know, you want to be a basketball player, but you can't shoot a jump shot to save your life. <laughs> you know, so sometimes there are times that, you know, sometimes the dreams that we have may not coincide with what we're actually meant to do. But when you find those things that you're actually meant to do and you're actually good at, even if, you know, there's a lot of people that I know that, you know, like um, I have a friend that is good at doing hair, mm -hmm. but she hates doing hair. <laughs> She's amazing <laughs> at doing it, uh -huh. but she hates doing it. So, you know, like, but, she continued to do it and she got to a point where it became a business and it became her uh, day job, you know, mm -hmm. but it was something that, you know, she found her thing, but she, that's not exactly what she mm -hmm. wanted to do, right. but it's what she was supposed to be doing. Right. So, you know, the thing is to find what you're supposed to be doing and what you're good at. And it's not always going to be the thing that you want to do, but if you stick with it, Mm. then usually it'll turn out good for you right mm. very that's that's very funny <laughs> funny how that worked <laughs> <Yeah>. out <laughs> yeah yeah definitely so yeah, now she loves it you know <laughs> so how how did um how did what was the the first moment or the first time that you fell in love with music and you realized you know this is something that i want to do um Honestly, like the first time I wrote my first rap when I was nine years old. And, wow. you know, I think that, you know, just seeing videos and being introduced to hip hop through, you know, MC Light and being introduced to hip hop through Big Daddy Kane and oh, wow. KRS-One. And, you know, a lot of the cats that I saw when I was young, because, you know, when, when I was nine years old, that was 89. So, you know, that was a long time ago, but it was you know, a time when hip hop was really just kind of growing and coming into its own. And, um, you know, I always wrote poems and short stories and things like that when I was young. And, you know, I was always in love with the English language, thanks to my mother. And um, once I realized that this could be done with words, you know, that I didn't have to learn how to sing, mm -hmm. you know, I could say my poetry over a beat and right. people would like it. You know what I'm saying? Like, so at that time, you know, about nine, 10, um, you know, I, I, I kept writing. And once I um, once I got to middle school is when I first started performing mm -hmm. and doing shows. And the first performances I did was actually with my church. Um, so I started out performing in church oh, and, wow. you know, just really understanding and seeing that my words could move people in that that way, you know, made me kind of focus on that and really want to make it a goal to really get better at it and hopefully make it a career. Right. Was this uh, hereditary? Did music run in your family or was this, are you the first one that's part of the, um, you know, the music industry? Well, I am the first one that's really part of the industry, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, my grandmother was a pastor and she had a great voice. Um, mm -hmm. She could always sing um, mm -hmm. really well. My mother can sing, um, but they never, you know, pursued it in that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm really the first in my family to pursue music as a career. Right. Um, but, you know, it it, it kind of was, and I think my, my family, my mother, my grandmother, you know, my family has always been encouraging you know, for me to continue to push, um, you know, anytime there would be a little write up or, you know, something about my music, my family is always celebratory, you know, in that fact. So they've always been extremely supportive in me, you know, moving in that direction. So it's, it's been really cool. But, you know, I am the first one to really like shoot for the stars in that nice. area. 
Now, I, I would imagine that, you know, as with you doing music and photography and all this, your kids are watching uh, what you do. Are they kind of now, are they trying to get involved and trying to follow your steps? Not all of them. Um, my youngest, um, he has a YouTube channel. Oh, wow. Uh, so, you know, he does, um, and, he, and he's working in, you know, um, modeling and fashion. Uh -huh. um, so he just... Um, because my mother-in-law is a seamstress so she gave him you know a sewing machine and taught him some things about sewing and stuff um so the last like few weeks he's been like you know um making his own pants and nice. you know just <laughs> making little alterations to pants uh -huh. and you know just kind of diving in and he wants to start a clothing line um you know and do some things like that and you know my other sons are in the sports and things like that so you know my youngest has the artistic um part you know there and my older kids because I was a track runner in high school and oh wow you know things yeah. like that so you know they have different parts of me mm -hmm. you know what I mean and um it's really cool to see you know right. them develop and and grow yeah and I think even you know just I believe that you know everything um can be hereditary and you know I would imagine that now you know from uh, from your grandmother's being in, you know, not in the music industry, but, you know, some type, some part of music where, you know, they sing and now it's flown on to you. I would imagine that you would be excited to now see what your kids are going to evolve to do, you know, and it's mm -hmm. kind of like you, you also got to build like, or create a path also for your future generation. Now that your past generation has all have also, you know, created this path that now led to where you are now, right? right. Yeah, I mean, my um, I have a nephew that uh, he wants to be a producer. Mm -hmm. So you know, like um, you know, I've 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 had him over here and you know started showing him some things and um, you know, bought him a little MIDI controller for Christmas and <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to be you know having him over a lot more um just to you know learn how to make beats and. You know, just just make sure that that interest doesn't die right. um, in him. So, you know, I have, you know, other, you know, members of the family, you know, cousins and nephews and things like that, that are definitely interested in hip hop and that I'm doing my best to try to help them out and, you know, give them some knowledge of what I've learned so far. Nice, nice. Good for you, man. Now you're, I mean, you're, you're a rapper, you're a photographer, your husband, your father, how do you have time to do all these things? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, no, it, it just takes, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of scheduling. It takes a lot of communication um, because, you know, like my wife understands that, you know, there's, cause I have a schedule and, you know, so um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or, you know, whatever my schedule is for that week, my wife knows that from, you know, 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., I'm going to be in the studio, mm -hmm. you know, working on something. Um, and, you know, and I make sure that that's communicated with her, mm -hmm. you know, that she knows. And it also frees her up to do things that she wants to do right. during those times as well. It's like, OK, I don't have to entertain my husband or the kids <laughs> so I can do my own thing. Um, and we both enjoy our time together, but we also are both pretty ambitious. Um, I mean, she has, you know, a baking company oh, um, wow. that, you know, she bakes cakes and cupcakes and does event tables and things nice. like that. So she has her own thing. So we both are pretty ambitious people mm -hmm. and we do enjoy our time separate to, you know, be able to create and, um, you know, work on our own businesses. So, but that's extremely important you know, to be communicative with the people that are in your life to make sure that you can fit everything in because it gets, it gets, it gets daunting at times, you know, there's only 24 right. hours in a day. Yes. Yes. Very true. And, um, you know, when is, how complicated is it to create beats? Because I, I mean, like I said, one of the big albums that you created was celestial clockwork the worst was when i just got introduced to you and um just the beats on it were i mean they were insane 
how mm. how complicated is it to make beats like that or just any beats at all well um for celestial clockwork i actually didn't do the production on that oh, blueprint okay. um did all the production on that oh, he okay. actually produced my first three albums um and actually the only album that i've ever produced of my own was my last album autopilot mm. that i put out mm -hmm. um in october of last year i just started producing about six years ago oh, it's something okay. that i always wanted to do um but it always seemed so difficult to do um and you know being around it for you know two decades seeing people make beats and understanding where samples come from and things like that um you know, I wanted to try it. So I was a little ahead of the curve because of the people that I've been around and, you know, being able to see it for as long as I have and being around some of the best producers in the underground, you know. Um, so, you know, for me, it hasn't been that difficult of a transition to learn, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it did take a lot of study. You know, I would, you know, for about two or three years, I didn't write a rhyme at all. I would just oh, wow. watch YouTube videos and try to make beats. Oh, wow. And that was my focus. And so it does take a lot of time, but if you're dedicated to it, you know, I think, you know, people can definitely learn um, mm -hmm. how to do anything, you know, these days, especially with YouTube and tutorials and things like that. Right. You mentioned that you had gone to college. Now, were, were you taking classes that helped your your music career? Not necessarily. Um, I was, um, at the time when I went to the University of Cincinnati is where I uh, went to school first. Mm. Um, and I was majoring in journalism at the time. So I was mm. taking writing courses and things like that. Um, but I didn't finish. I only did the one year and then I dropped out. And then I went back to school for um, communications. Mm. And then I got my master's degree in information systems. Mm -hmm. So I haven't necessarily gone to school for anything related to music, but I've, I'm pretty self-taught um, as far as most of the, you know, the musical acumen that I have um, as far as the production and things of that um, nature. And, you know, just as a rapper, just enjoying writing and enjoying language and English and all that stuff, you know, that's, that's where I get all that from. But I've never gone to school for anything related to music, actually. Nice. Okay. And, you know, I think uh, music is, music is just, a, uh, you know, this thing that's just so crazy that we have because it can, you know, it can change how we feel. It could change mm -hmm. our emotions. It can yeah. motivate us. It's like it kind of has a connection to either you know our conscious or our subconscious you know yeah yeah music is powerful um i don't know um you know as i'm a christian so as a christian we're um in the bible it, it, it tells us that you know satan was the minister of music in heaven before he was kicked out mm -hmm. so the fact that music has such an impact on our emotional well-being is no accident you know what I'm saying? There's a reason that, you know, according to, you know, scripture, that there's choirs in heaven. You know, mm -hmm. there's a reason that, you know, in the Bible, it says to make a joyful noise. There's a reason that, you know, people are taught to sing and learn how to sing and play instruments, that instruments exist because these things are powerful. These things definitely can make you have a good day or make you have a bad day. You know, if you're having a good day and you listen to a happy song, it'll make you have a happier day and it'll keep you pushing. You know, if you're in a bad mood and you listen to a song that, you know, um, elevates that mood, then it'll make you feel a certain way. Like there's, or music can just change your mood. You know, like right. I'm feeling bad. I'm going to throw on something that's a little more uplifting and, and it can make you feel better. Like music is, entertainment in general is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, watching mm -hmm. movies and listening to music and, you know, watching TV shows and reading books, all of this stuff, all of this media is definitely, definitely a powerful thing. So I do my best to make sure that I use my power for, you know, as good as I can. Nice. Now, you being a, a Christian, I, there's a couple of under, underground artists that are, you know, not too much in 
religion or it can be a bit of atheist do you get any pushback from then on your beliefs or anything like that no not at all mm -hmm. i mean I've, i've always been um accepted and championed for being you know brave enough to stand on what i believe mm -hmm. as opposed to running from it um and i think it also helps that i'm not you know one of the christians that are super judgmental and you know pushy. are always preachy and pushy you know and things like that like you know i i just happen i'm a rapper that happens to be a christian mm -hmm. i don't consider myself a christian rapper you know so right the fact that my beliefs do make their way into my music it's not in a way to make you feel bad about yourself it's not in a way to make you you know usually i utilize you know the knowledge of my christianity to uplift or teach in some way as opposed to you know the fire and brimstone that a lot of people you know relate to christianity so um but i think i've always been kind of looked at as that being an attribute to me as an artist as opposed to a detriment mm, very nice now you started you know you were in i would say probably a good year when everything was kind of getting hyped and getting and you were you saw this movement of hip-hop and i mean i was doing you know i was tagging and i was doing graffiti and some of the things that I would always see is how much uh, music and, you know, especially hip hop coincided with graffiti. And that was usually, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, when you had uh, Funk Master Flesh, uh, you had KRS One, you had Eric B and Rock Kim. How were you, did you ever happen to go to like their concerts or anything like that? Were you around that since you were part of kind of part in the music industry? Well, I, ne I never, I never, um, I, I did open for Rakim um, oh, wow. when he came here in Columbus. Um, me and Blueprint actually did as Greenhouse. Um, so I did get to, you know, see him live and, um, you know, shake his hand. Um, but there's few artists, you know, that I've had that opportunity with. Um, I've opened for Busta Rhymes and Y Clef Jean. Wow. Um, um, got to, you know, actually hang out with Marilyn Manson backstage before, because um, he was doing a show. We were at the House of Blues in the smaller room and he was in the bigger room and, but the, the backstages were connected. So I actually ran into him just randomly and, you know, got to say what's up to him and, um, actually gave him a cigarette uh, <laughs> at the time when I when I smoked but uh you know like I've I've had you know kind of cool experiences um getting to meet some of my heroes and um you know it's something that you know I wouldn't have if it wasn't for music um you know like um I'm not sure if you're uh familiar with uh freestyle fellowship or abstract rude yes. or um so like abstract rude was you know, he was on AC Alone's um, All Balls Don't Bounce album. And I was a huge fan of his. Um, and um, he was on tour with Atmosphere and it came to Columbus. And um, I performed at the after party of that show. And it just so happens the Abstract Root came to the after party. Oh, wow. So I got oh, to wow. meet him and eventually we became friends. Um, he was on my Capture the Sun album. Um, and, you know, like, it's cool that I've actually got to become friends with, you know, some of the people that I looked up to when I was younger. So it's, right. it's, it's been a really cool ride, man. You yeah. know, I can't, I can't complain at all. Right. How was it with uh, meeting Marilyn Manson? It was, I mean, it was, it was really short, you know what I'm saying? Mm. It was kind of weird. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, I was, you know, this is when I smoked a lot of weed and, you know, got <laughs> drunk on tour. Um, so I was super high and, you know, like, kind of drunk and I'm walking and you know and I look up and I'm like and I'm thinking to myself like is that Marilyn Manson coming down the hall you know what I mean <laughs> like, so you know we kind of pass each other in the hall and I had a cigarette 
And um, he was like, yo, can I bum one of those? Yeah. And I was like, sure. I was like, you're Miller Manson, right? He was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, we're doing a show, you know, in the spa room. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm over here. If you guys are, you know, if you guys are free, you guys can just come over and check out the show. But our shows were kind of at the same time, so it didn't happen. But oh. it was just, I mean, he seemed pretty cool. You know what I mean? Right. Like, he looked weird, but he had a regular <laughs> voice. And, you know, he's just a regular dude, you know, just backstage right. at a show, you know. I, I love his his music, but and even his his videos are always it's like one of those things that uh, you can't stop watching it because it's so disturbing, you know, mm -hmm. where it's just it's a lot of weird stuff going on, but you kind of you kind of like it and you just keep on watching it. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I like I the like beautiful it. people is probably my favorite video. Oh, of his. yes, yes, yes. I love that one. Um, yeah, and I mean, even the, you know, KRS One. He, I mean, and you know, this whole change um, from back in the late ladies and early nineties to now, and you know, the music industry, especially hip hop, has completely. I feel like it has completely changed, and you know, to me, it's kind of sandy. Where, you know, I'm the type of person that you know one of the reasons why I really enjoy your music was because it was to me it felt like poetry and you know it was stuff that really made me think and think about things and just you know have my mind explore mm -hmm. but now there's a lot of music out there that's just a bunch of gibberish I mean right. some of the stuff just it doesn't make sense or you know it's just it doesn't say anything you know yeah yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that the, the thing is what has changed was what has changed is what um, what they choose to push. Mm. You know, like if you if you're an underground fan of music, then there's still, you know, a lot of music out there. You just have right. to look for it. Right. You know, like, I mean, with the advent of Spotify and Apple Music and all that now you know, there, even if it's not getting played on the radio, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're into exploring new music, then you can always find new music. Right. You know, it's just, it just takes a little more work than it right. did, you know, when I was younger. Um, but it's always out there, you know, like the industry definitely, definitely has changed as far as what they put in front of the public. But, you know, there is still a lot of really good artists and a lot of really good music you know out there you just have to look for it right and i mean it's great that now we have you know um spotify and yeah spotify and youtube because now that's another platform where you know underground artists can just be on and you know that's where people can find what you know exactly what they're looking for you know yeah. and i mean um you know and it it I feel like even just lyrical speaking has completely changed and just mm -hmm. watching, you know, the human evolution. I don't know if maybe what eventually what will, what will music eventually become, you know? Yeah. Because I yeah, mean, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Because, you know, we started, I mean, first of all, you know, like words where, you know, there's so much behind it that we don't understand and mm -hmm. just you know years from now what what will it be evolved into you know it, yeah. it, are we eventually just gonna telepathically communicate with one another <laughs> you know <laughs> I, yeah i don't i don't know i mean i think um i think music will always have a part in the fabric of human existence um, no matter how it's transmitted, mm. I think it'll always have a part. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't see music going away. Mm -hmm. Um, I see it, you know, transforming into, you know, different things and there being, you know, just like now they, there's so many different types of music right. that, you know, you can become a fan of there's everything. You know, like there's there's all kinds of stuff. There's stuff there's you know, it's one thing that I find interesting, you know, every now and then I'll just 
you know, look through Spotify and mm-hmm. see, you know, who the top selling people are. And a lot of times I have no idea who they are mm-hmm. and I'll listen to it and it'll be, you know, some kind of, you know, electronic, you know, like avant-garde folk music or something, but <laughs> they have like 5 million listeners on Spotify. You know yeah. what I mean? Like in the fact that there's so many different types of music and there's so much out there that 5 million people can listen to something that you have no idea of what it is and who the artist is, is an amazing thing. And I I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. I think it's just going to, you know, continue to get bigger. Right. I guess it all just depends what you grew up in as, no? And Mm -hmm what gets what kind of gets introduced to you and i mean one of the reasons why i was um you know i was well i was born in the 90s and what really kept me involved with like hip-hop and stuff like that was because of my older brother and my older sister they listened to hip-hop you know they listened to krs1 they listened to dr dre to snoop uh you know to all them and that's what kind of kept me um you know involved in that and that's that's where I just stuck so now I feel like you know it seems like now there's a new wave and you know maybe we don't understand it because it's not it wasn't part of our era now it's yeah a new era that it's this is this is them we already had our type of music and now this is them to enjoy you know? yeah I mean I completely agree I'm you know having teenage boys they don't listen to the music that I listen to, you know, they listen to, they have their own music. And as much as sometimes I might not like it, you know, like I have to allow them right. to, you know, have, you know, what they feel is expressive mm-hmm. art, you know, for their time. Um, and it's always been like that. You know, our parents had their music, right. you know, we have our music, our kids are going to have their music, their kids are going to have their music True. and so on and so so forth. So, um, but I think that it's important for us as the older generation who, you know, especially with hip hop, who grew up with kind of the pure form of hip hop to not shun the newer generation, just because we don't like what they talk about. We don't necessarily like, you know, what, um, what it sounds like, so on and so forth. Um, But to listen to it and try to get an understanding of where this generation is headed because usually the music is an indication of you know the types of attitudes um the Mm -hmm. types of um you know thoughts and Mm -hmm. goals that you know the next generation has and unfortunately with the music industry they've you know made popular a lot of things that are not intellectual a lot of things that don't right. teach us anything of substance. Um, so it's up to us as the, you know, the older heads to make sure that our kids understand what they're listening to and understand that, you know, there was a time that hip hop taught us something. Right. You know, there was a time that hip hop was more than just drugs, guns, and girls. You know, like there was a time when it was it was it was a lot more than that. Um, so that's really our responsibility, but we have to do it without being pushy and without being dismissive, you know, of, of what they're, um, they're listening to and what, you know, they are creating. Right. That's very, that's, that's a very good point. And, you know, because music can, not only can it be music, but it can also be a way to inform somebody of what mm-hmm. is the current state of humanity. Because, yeah. you know, if you listen to something in the past, it can tell you what was going in the past. You know, it right. can tell you what kind of stories, what kind of people were involved and kind of what was going on in order for you to somewhat understand and somewhat explore what that music was all about. Right. It's just like yeah, definitely. music from, you know, from... 70s where you know they were they were uh, singing about the vietnam war then you're like mm-hmm. oh, okay you know now i understand and at least that gives you an opportunity to go 
you know, listen to music and discover what exactly they were talking about. Right. Yeah, that's I mean, music has always been kind of the um, kind of the 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 expressive form of sharing stories and sharing mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even going back to African tribes and Indian tribes, mm -hmm. they would have drum circles and tell stories. And they would do it in a way that was related to a musical form. So it would be easier to remember, mm. you know, and that's that's the reason that a lot of our history was shared in those kind of ways. Um, and now we have music, you know, if it, it's it's interesting how, you know, we can hear a song three or four times and we can remember the hook. Right. You know, we can, you know, because when you put stuff, it's just like the ABCs, the fact that the ABCs right. are to a melody, <laughs> it makes it easier to remember, you know, the fact that, you know, there's certain things that even learning as a young child, when you put it to a melody, it makes it easier to remember and it makes it easier to put into, you know, you as a person. So that's why music is so powerful, because, you know, even if we're not listening, that that melody can catch us. There's songs that, you know, I hate with a passion, but because they come on the radio 20 times a day, I know right. the lyrics to them just because <laughs> of the melody and just because, you know, of the music. So it's extremely powerful and it's a, it's a great tool. And, you know, I think a lot of people need to understand that, um, you know, it's very important to understand the power, you know, that we have as musicians. Um, to, you know, kind of shape the reality for people. Because um, like you said, you know, a lot of times you can listen to music and tell what's going on right. in the right. world. You know, you can listen to music from, you know, Venezuela and mm. know mm. what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Know what went on in the 70s or 60s or whatever. If you listen to the music, you can kind of get a gist of, right. you know, how people were feeling and what was going on at the time. And um it's just it's just a great thing to you know be able to create and and listen to and be a fan of right right how do you um how do you are you big uh big on social media and stuff like that not not nearly as much as i used to be um you know more now i use social media as a tool mm. um to you know interact with my fans interact with some family um right but you know i'm not just on social media for hours and hours, just scrolling and, you know, watching TikTok videos and things like that. Like I do get, you know, caught up in a YouTube, you know, vortex here and there, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, you know, I try my best to not, you know, be on it too much because, you know, it can get you upset. It can yes. put you in, you know, certain moods and I try to avoid that as much as I can. Right, right, very nice. And uh, so when uh, you said during the pandemic, you also started uh, your own podcast. Um, what was, how has that experience been? It's been great, man. Like it was, um, you know, it was, it was like something that I used to try to connect with my fans a little more. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in that process, I've actually, you know, there are certain people that anytime that I go live, like they're in the room. You know, so there's, you know, certain people, there's a good, you know, five to 10, you know, heads that I've gotten really familiar with in the last year to where, you know, like, you know, we're sending each other, you know, like messages for, you know, Merry Christmas and things like that, you know, and mm -hmm. um, so it's been a real eye opening experience and a real um, cool experience to see that I have fans out there that have become friends in a right. way you know and I, I think that's really what I've always wanted for my fan base to become more of my friends than just my fans just listening to me from a distance but actually having um, some personal interaction with me right. and creating my um, my um, my live show has has helped with that right do you get any like negative feedback or, you know, those angry people that comment or anything like that? I haven't actually, oh I haven't God. had any, any real negative experiences about anything um, that I've done because really like most of the people that are checking it out, want to check it out, like mm. want to be there, mm. you know? So 
I haven't had any issues with anybody really being negative at all. Um, you know, there's some certain things that, you know, people may say that I don't necessarily consider negative. They're just, you know, giving their opinions. Mm. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with people giving their honest opinions about mm. what I'm doing, but it's nothing that's been blatantly, you know, negative um, or a turn off or anything. Right. So what motivated you or inspired you to, you know, start this podcast? Um, really just, I, I had an album to promote, you know, and everything was shut down. Um, I was, I had a lot more time at home. Um, I didn't have to go back and forth to work. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking like, you know, at this point, it would be cool to be able to interact with people. So, you know, I made some investments in some cameras and lighting and things like that. And, um, uh, just kind of started, started doing it. And, you know, I've been doing it for probably about eight months, you mm -hmm. know, now, um, if you, um, go to YouTube and, um, search illogic beats and B-sides, you can see like all the different shows that I've done. Um, I, you know, I've, I make beats live. Um, I, you know, won the anniversary of albums of mine. I, you know, will give a, you know, talk about the album and, the you know explain songs and mm. lyrics and things like that mm -hmm. um i have played unreleased music mm. um you know things that i'm working on um right. kind of you know giving people a, a a peek behind the curtain you know so to speak um to see the process and you know things like that so i do a lot of different things it doesn't you know i and i'm going to be trying to um dip into interviewing a little bit this year mm -hmm. um so i'm going to try to expand it into you know something more um but it's been really fun and it's been another you know outlet for me to right. express myself and and show things right and with with you being you know a rapper i would imagine that there's a lot of uh memory muscle going on to where you have to remember a lot of words, a lot of lyrics. What is mm -hmm. one of the tools that you've implemented into your lifestyle that has kind of helped you with that? Honestly, I don't have any like specific things to, for memory. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, repetition, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Doing something over and over and over again until, you know, it's just part of you. And, you know, like whenever I have to do shows or anything like that, like, I, I have to like bunker down and listen to, you mm -hmm. know, my albums like 20 mm -hmm. times, you know, to make sure <laughs> that, you know, I remember um, mm -hmm. the lyrics and stuff, but I don't have any specific, you know, exercises or anything for memory. Right. Oh, very cool. Well, you know, Logic, I, I appreciate you coming on. I, I, you know, thank you very much. This was, it was, I had a great time and, uh, cool. you know, just, uh, tell the listeners where they can listen to your music. Um, well, you can, you know, just search Illogic 614 on YouTube. Um, really, Illogic 614 on all of my social media. Mm. Facebook is um, actually, hold on, Instagram, Twitter, um, and YouTube are all Illogic 614. Um, also, Twitch um, is Illogic 614. YouTube is Illogic 1, um, spelled out Illogic O N E. And um, also my website is imelogic.com. Um, you can buy my music on my Bandcamp page, um, illogic.bandcamp.com. And yeah, just follow me and, you know, you'll be able to see some of the, the craziness that goes on in my life. Right. Nice. Is there, is there a meaning to the 614? Uh, that's my, um, the area code of Columbus, oh. Ohio, where I'm from. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Well, like I said, thank you very much, Logic. Um, you know, it was it was great. And, you know, thank you for coming on. Like I said, you were, you know, you were one of the ones that I usually I listen to a lot. And, you know, just here having this conversation with you is just it's mind blowing. I can't even, you know, I can't believe it's happening. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> cool. I, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you for everything. All right, man. man. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I appreciate the support, you know, throughout the years. Just, you know, just keep on doing what you're doing. Because, I mean, I'm a listener and, you know, I hope there's there's more listeners, you know, that are going to you. And 
I hope um, you know you. I mean, I hope the, the, your crowd, your audience, just get and your fans get more and more. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. All right, man. Thank you. All right. All You're right. welcome. Take Have care. a good one. You too. Peace. All right. Bye. Thank you.